Good evening, good afternoon. I'm so happy to see that everybody's still here. Wow, it's been a really amazing dynamic weekend. And um, I'm sure that each and every one of you are as empowered as I am by the amazing caliber of people, the scientists and the knowledge and the wisdom that they've been sharing with us. I'm just immensely honored to be in your presence and to be able to share a little bit of what I have learned by working in the media industry for over 15 years and how you may be able to uh, take a few points and hopefully um, utilize the power of the media to influence the public perceptions of elephants and all, um, all wildlife for that matter. So I'm going to start out with uh, a personal story of mine. When I was a six-year-old young girl, um, well, to begin with, my parents were very poor. I was born and raised in Kerala, India, and I, I belong to the Brahmin caste, which is the highest caste. And I don't say that with pride because I don't believe in caste system whatsoever. Um, but that was, that's just the truth. But still, my parents were very humble because they thought having money is a bad thing. And so we were sort of like almost just along the, just above the poverty line. And so we were living in this um, sort of like a common area where you used uh, common toilets and stuff. And I don't know how many of you have been to India, but the toilets are not all that welcoming. And so, um, so at this, at, I'm six years of age, and I'm walking into this public toilet, which is not the public toilet kind of stuff that we have here, which is a little bit hygienic. Um, but but I, I walk in there, and inside the potty, I see, and it's not, it's not the kind of potty we have here. You have to squat. And so inside that potty, I see this something doing this and I'm like oh my god that's a sparrow and I, I can't I can't use the washroom I can't use the you know toilet and I'm like trying to run away and then I'm like no 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 but if and this is at the age of six but if I went away somebody else is going to poop on that bird and that bird is going to get flushed and so or not flushed and then I'm thinking to myself what am I going to do I had to think on my feet I step outside and then I come back in and with this bare right hand, I stick it in the potty, which was filthy. I put my finger in like that, and the little bird climbed on my finger. And I was six years of age. And I, and I came out, and there was this fence wall. And I put the bird on the fence. And he almost like turned back, and he looked at me like, at that age, I can still remember so vividly. He fluttered his thing, shaking up all the shit. <laughs> and, then, and then he kind of, in a smiling way, he kind of like turned around. And that image left such a profound impression in my heart and soul at that tender age. And I decided I wanted to do biology. So when I went and did my natural sciences, ecology, my bachelor in you know, science and everything. And then I said, oh, with all this amazing knowledge in biology, I know I can make a difference. I became a teacher. I used to teach grades 10, 11, and 12. I lived in Kenya for three years, in Mumbai for a few years. I taught and taught. And I'm like, ah, this is just not so satisfying. The big way to make a difference is by finding a job, by working at a television a new station and I've always been a huge fan of working um, and being a reporter and working in the media well the harsh reality is that I, I by the time I moved to Canada then I did my journalism and blah 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 and I got a job um, in the media industry I used to work for Omni television CTV and all these and Rogers and all these uh, popular TV stations I never ever could do what I was meant to do which is talk about nature and wildlife. My whole entire, all of my aspirations were so suppressed. And I became so depressed. And at one point, I left Canada and I moved to Bermuda for nine years because I got a job as an ABC CBS anchorwoman um, in, in Bermuda. And 
Even there, they promised that I would be a health and environment reporter, but they ended up sending me to every Tom, Dick, and Harry reporting, like, you know, chasing the fire, chasing after the police, chasing after the day-to-day -day bread, and, bread and butter, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, that kind of stories. My spirit began to die. And I thought to myself, this is not what I am meant to do. One fine day, I was in the court covering the story of a young girl who was raped by her stepfather. I sat there, and I'm looking at this girl, and, and the father is looking at her in, in a way that he's intimidating her to try to tell her, don't say a word. And I'm sitting there tense. My eyes are filled with tears. The judge, the justice, is looking at me from there. And he's this British guy, and he's doing this. He has this you know, beard, and I, I can still see him. And all of a sudden, I just dropped everything in that moment. I walked out of the court. I went and I handed in my resignation. I said, I can't do this. I said, I can't do this. This is not what I'm meant to do. You hired me to be an environment and health reporter but this is not what I'm doing. And that was when my whole life changed. This was in 2008, 10 years later, and that's when I embarked on the journey to become a documentary film producer. And I also did my master's in environmental education and communication. My pet peeve was the media. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to get you guys now. And so my thesis was connecting the news media climate change and uh, television news coverage. So based on that thesis, I'm going to present you something today that, that is actually totally applicable to what we are facing with our wildlife. So that's just a little bit of background that I wanted to give you from a six-year-old child to where I am today right now. I'm definitely not six. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, yeah, the 24-hour news cycle is pretty phenomenal. It drives each and every one of us insane, and it's actually addictive. Um, sometimes I, I watch CNN, and you know, you just get so sucked into this, and I'm like, I can't. I, I, I got to get out of get out get out of this couch, and I got to do the research on elephants, and I push myself to do that. And so this is when I did that thesis. Uh, Bill Hutchison was a dear friend of mine. He was a nighttime TV news anchor uh, at, at at CTV. And he said this, it's the 24-hour news cycle that we live in, and it's a voracious animal called the 24-hour news that you got to feed consistently on an ongoing basis. And so what happens is, because it is a 24-hour voracious animal, what happens is the coverage you're getting is really, really poor because the news reporters don't have enough time to do the research that they are meant to do. They're all about in the moment, right here and now, and the coverage is just so sloppy. It's all about being looking glamorous and being glamorous, and it's less about substance and more about you know this, the celebrity status. That's that's what I feel at the moment about the, the the news coverage. So the BBC's editor, he himself confessed that the uh, the, the coverage during the uh, COP10 was really really inadequate, and. We all know that you know the the Asian elephants are an endangered uh, are, are an endangered species as enlisted by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, and that we are going through the sixth mass extinction of species. But still, regardless of such a dire situation of our planet Earth, the two major Canadian news television channels, that is the CBC and CTV that I tuned into, they did not cover the news story at all. And so I started, began, I began my research, and here's what I discovered, that environmental issues are largely ignored by the mainstream media, and it is difficult to engage journalists and editors on the issues. And clearly, you know, they don't sit down and read scientific books in the evenings, and so what happens is even doctors are being trained by the media. So just imagine the kind of impact it is having in the minds of the public. And so this is really news that I myself was shocked to, to learn that you know, even doctors depend on the news media. 
And that came from Dr. Gordon McBain, who is, uh, yeah, who's a climate scientist, and he is one of the IPCC scientists also, uh, authors. Um, and then more research, the capacity of the news media to respond to the environmental issues um, it has been resoundingly demonstrated on several levels. And the other most important thing is that while the media may shape the public risk and perceptions, it also articulates the public opinion. And thereby, when, when, public, when the public has an opinion, then it can really shape and mold the policies, which is what you know, the group of people before me were talking about, legislation and policies. So ultimately, it boils down to this. The public opinion is shaped by the media and that public opinion is so important to create legislations and regulations that mold and shape our own planet Earth. That's how significant the media influence is. And so Boykov, he said that the intersection of mass media, science, and policy is a particularly dynamic area of communication in which all sides have high stakes. And this is where we need to really stop and ponder and think how incredibly important it is for us as scientists and researchers to disseminate the information to the journalists and the media in a manner that they would be empowered to cover the news stories. What can we do about that? A lot of things were discussed during the panel session yesterday also, where you know it was mentioned that we make the lives of these reporters much easier by giving them all of the research they need, by giving them as much information as they need. But that doesn't really help in a 24-hour news cycle, because when you overwhelm them with so much information, they'll just tune out. So if you imagine for one particular moment that out of that entire research that uh, all the research papers that you're trying to present to the media what is the what is the crux of the news story and then elaborate on that and give about two three four key points for them to then work on it by breaking down the language the scientific language into simple terms and giving them enough material and say here's the link if you want more information I can talk to you about it I can explain to you in an easier language so it'll be easier for you I can even provide you with sources that you can interview those kinds of stuff could uh, end up helping them I don't know how many of you have heard of this earth charter this is something that I was introduced to when I was doing my masters and the Earth Charter was created by a group of people from various backgrounds, from diverse backgrounds and scientific backgrounds from many, many countries. All of them came together and they said, we got to create a charter which will explain the value of Earth and what are the imperatives in protecting our planet Earth. And one of them is a media imperative, that the media has an obligation to uphold the right of everyone to receive clear and timely information because public perception of environmental issues is influenced by media constructions of scientific knowledge and again it goes back to how we can simplify the scientific language and give them um, easy information access easy access to information so how do we enhance the role of the media in raising awareness of ecological and social challenges? Because when you really consider what's going on, uh, lots were a lot of things were mentioned about you know, how the elephant crisis is related to terrorism. Anything related to how it will impact human beings is the way we need to present every single environmental story to the, to the reporters and the mass media. So that is number one point that you may want to consider is any time you present something, a lot of things were mentioned about public safety threat, health safety threats. Uh, uh, tuberculosis is a zoonotic disease. And so how it can spread from humans to elephants and from elephants to humans and break it down in a simple language and rather than using zoonotic as the word, some of them may don't even know what that means and they won't even have the time to do the research. So try and give them as basic information as possible. Um, so what is needed then? What is needed is the combined effects of human population growth, threats to biodiversity, fragmented and degraded habitats, and climate change. They need to be presented in a more compelling manner 
to reach as many audiences as possible. And this is something that you can consider not just for the media, but when you speak with the schools, when you speak with the, you know, at the PTA meetings, like how can you use the language? We are passionate um, elephant advocates. And so whatever we say is definitely going to be biased, but also uh, based on scientific facts that we do know. If we sort of take a step back and set aside our our passion and anger and everything for a moment and just say these are the scientific facts that I'm presenting that could be one way to present it to the media and to everybody else and so then you talk about the ethical imperative and the ethical dilemmas that we are facing in our current world and so the TV news is what I worked on so that's what I call the elephant in the room um, so I uh, my thesis question was this what are the factors that influence the newsroom producers to feature stories uh, that will impact the public perceptions? Um, so here are some of the key factors. What is the story today? What is important today? What has been announced today? And so they cover it from such a narrow angle in this 24-hour news cycle. But when you really think about it, in that same 24-hour news cycle, when they cover the same stories over and over and over and over again, it becomes kind of boring. That may be a way to approach them and say, I'm sure in this 24-hour news cycle, you would like to see something different and present a story and present it in a way that is different rather than cruelty or rather than, you know, uh, anything that reflects animal activism, but rather scientific uh, facts. So that could work. Um, and the other thing is that it needs to be a set, it needs to, the, the television news is sensitive to the popular tastes, meaning how do we then change the public perception and so how do we change the popular tastes of the public uh, and, the, uh, you know, and, and the, the public that is actually viewing the news media in particular communities. And this is where community activists and advocacy will Will, will play a significant role in you guys conducting like town hall meetings and organizing community groups. That could in and of itself be a great news story that you know there are community workshops and community gatherings that are being organized when you have young children come and talk passionately about this. I always use the, I, I always say children because children are not only the wave of our future and they are our future generation, but also that Generally, the news media tend to gravitate towards what? Look at this young child, what she has done. It's phenomenal when they get this kind of recognition and appreciation in schools, right? So that is one way to look at it. The other thing that actually shapes the news media is the journalistic trend. You know, the, the coverage is sporadic. So for instance, when you consider the example of climate change, um, you had the three major hurricanes last year. It was climate change was a topic of discussion a lot for a, for a little while, but then it faded away. <clears throat> so it continues to to be sporadic. And then what happens is the public has, you know, the attention span is not as it's it's like it's not stuck to one particular topic, and so then people move on to the next thing and then the next thing. So how do we bring them bring the media back into the into covering the same news story again, but using a different angle? What are the different angles you can come up with to entice the media and say, hey, this is something new. Everything new is what the media is looking for. Something exclusive, as I mentioned yesterday, is what the media is looking for. For. Objectivity, fairness, accuracy, and balance, these are all the things, factors that also influence the news media. What kind of balance can you provide when climate change is happening? And you have the climate scientists, 99 or 97% of the climate scientists, agreeing that climate change is happening. And then to balance out the stories, they interview the deniers, and they end up getting a lot more time uh, news coverage, which is not fair. And so you can, you know, when you talk to the reporter, you can kind of say that if you had a heart attack, are you going to go and see a skin specialist? And so kind of plant seeds like that in their minds and sort of get them to understand that this is not something that actually can be balanced. There's nothing to balance about climate change. There's nothing to balance about the sixth mass extinction that is underway currently. You know, what is there to balance? Um, 
and, and of course, they also have a strong sense of their putative audience and how the story should be told. So even if, for example, if the scientists, they provide information, and even if you say this is the angle that is the best suited, at the end of the day, don't be disappointed when they choose a completely different angle. Because what they will do is using that same information you have provided, they'll go through the information and they'll say, oh, this is what my audience likes. And so that may end up being the, the you know, coverage of the day. At the time, what you can do is in every single paragraph, two, three, four paragraphs that you present, let there be the key information that you want to present, which has to be like the lead thing. For instance, elephants are an endangered species. I'm just giving you an example. That particular sentence has to be presented in all those paragraphs in different languages, in, a different, in different words, I should say, not different languages, in different words. And so when you present it in that manner, then they'll understand that, oh, this is an important point that we need to convey. So your key point is presented in almost every single paragraph in different ways. And then the deep disconnect between, you know, the news stories that goes on and the people, the audience that are viewing. We discuss this over and over again among our own little group in the background that, you know, Something that is happening in the far off distance, like the tsunami that unfolded in 2004, I think, it did not resonate with the North Americans until it hit home. You had Sandy's just crushing so many, um, lots of devastation happened. And then the last three hurricanes that happened last year, it caused severe destruction, devastation, deaths, and so when it happens home, they understand. So how do you bring what is happening in a far off distance, how do you bring that home? Here, people know elephants as they see them in circuses and zoos. And so perhaps that may be a starting point to engage in a conversation with the media saying, yes, there are elephants in the zoos, but they are supposed to be in the wild. And for this particular reason, they are the gardeners of our planet. Did you know that they're actually being robbed from the rainforest and brought here to do this display? And do you know the impact it can have, the long-term impact it can have on our planet, just like climate change? Because it is a keystone species. The survival of many species depend on the survival, uh, depends on the survival of the elephants. And elephants are the only species that are so massive. They walk for hours on end. They drop dung. And in the dung, there are seeds. Seeds become trees. And trees give us oxygen to breathe. And they take up the carbon dioxide. And they are our natural air filters. And these kinds of bullet points, if you provide and explain the long-term implications or the, you know, the, whatever is happening in the far off distance, how, can, how would that reverberate exactly where you are by bringing it close to home, by talking about the zoo elephants, that that's the place where they have come from. And when you're bringing them from there, this is what is happening over there, but the atmosphere is an open sink. If there is pollution in one particular area, it spreads across the whole planet. If there is going to be a shortage of whatever, like if there's no oxygen to breathe, you're going to be breathing in the polluted air. If the air is not purified naturally by these trees, it's going to be devastating for all of us. The second reason is that television coverage portrays the problems as isolated episodes. So they talk about these events that happen. Uh, oh, this devastation happened here. For instance, um, in, I think in Texas is where the, the greatest hurricanes happen, Harvey and, 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 and even in Florida. Um, so they talk about these events as episodes, but then they don't connect the dots, and they don't say that this could be because of sea level rise. This could be because of. They don't even put that could be perspective. They don't even give that, you know, potentially. They don't, they're so terrified of using the climate change phrase. And, you know, those are some of the things that we need to pay attention to and sort of start asking, so let's connect the dots. And as community groups, we have the power to influence the way the media even does the coverage by engaging the community themselves, communities themselves. And then the, uh, I talked about this already, the attention span is short-lived, and so, you know, personal engagement is also short-lived. 
And so then the question is, is fear-mongering effective? So those two elephants at the top, uh, the one that has a big bloated tummy, he was, cre he was actually... He was actually one of the elephants in my documentary, and to this date, I'm devastated that I could not do anything to prevent his death. He was a young 23-year-old bull elephant, and they fed him dates, and the dates contained seeds, and the seeds got clogged into his digestive system. And it was too late by the time they, they discovered that. And he died at such a young age when he should be, he should have been in the wild, mating and allowing his species to thrive. But this is what happened to him. And then the other young one who has got this, you know, yellow, that's turmeric powder, by the way. And she literally rotted to death. All those, all those yellow patches that you're seeing, that's where she had skin rot and foot rot. She was not featured in my film, but she's deeply etched in my memory because two years ago when she was asked to be euthanized the temple authority said we cannot euthanize it's a sin and I'm like are you insane it's a sin to euthanize but it's not a sin to harass and torture them and and deprive them of their basic necessities of life but how do you question that because then you become the enemy of the culture and as that's how they're framing me right now and then you see the, the, the bottom two images. Those are actually portrayed in my film also. But if I, if I continue to put these kinds of images, which is what we discussed yesterday partially on the Facebook page or even on the media, it'll turn off people. So fear-mongering is not as effective. But at the same time, we have to find a balance where we not only present the realities, but also offer solutions as to what they can do and how they can help the cause and not, not make them feel helpless and guilty. That doesn't work. Inducing fear in the minds of people will generate two psychological responses. They will try to either control the external danger or try to control the internal fear. And the way they'll do this is by avoiding the whole situation. They'll completely walk away from this. They'll become involved in doing other things. And then they'll say, some of them have even quit Facebook page because they're just not able to handle the kind of gory images that are being published on the Facebook page. And so that is one thing that the media is very cognizant of. And it and like I said, people become numb. And it is caused by the sense that people you know, they feel helpless. They feel like I'm alone in tackling this issue. And so we need to create that sense of community and empower people to let them know that you're not alone. We are going to be facing this together. So let's find, you know, coalition groups and discuss. And, and, and that's how I have a secret page where, you know, we discuss all kinds of stuff that we cannot publicly discuss, where we can openly hash out our feelings and anger and frustration and discuss ways to move forward. So the problem isn't too much fear, but too little capacity to respond to that fear in any meaningful way. It's the feeling of helplessness, in other words. And so that was actually by the PBS. They had this show called Nature, and I, I just loved that shot. And it kind of takes us right into this, you know, next level where people are thinking that the television news media producers are thinking that oh everybody's always racing for audience and ratings and stuff that was Richard McElveen who was a senior producer and my boss when I worked for the CTV news and he says that there's hardly he acknowledged that we need to do this he acknowledges that there is an imperative to step back and do environmental stories but there's rarely a time to sit back. And why is that? Because they are under serious pressure. They have to constantly churn up the news stories. But over and beyond that, they have the advertisers that they have to please. And so they have to continuously have sensationalizing stories. And so what Gordon McBain said from the scientific point of view is that the media outreach and mass communications is not part of the scorecard for researchers and scientists and therefore they fail to disseminate their findings and move on in search of grants which is not what I'm saying which is what Dr. Gordon McBain a climatologist acknowledged he said that the media says that while they need to cover the stories the scientists are saying that 
well, we need to disseminate the information. And then, so how do we engage the public media? You know, we need to provide the media with easily access accessible sets of facts, non-threatening imagery and icons that link individuals to their everyday emotions and concerns in the context of the macro environment, which is kind of like taking it from the episodic perspective to the thematic, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its individual parts, kind of like the systems thinking, systems biology that I'm a huge fan of. Um, and so here are some of the examples of the narr narratives, which I kind of already alluded to. It has to be based on what is in it for human beings, how the impact of extinction will be severe and possibly catastrophic if we do not take any strong measures, and how we cannot take any strong measures if we don't get the political you know, buying into it, and how we won't get the political buying if the media doesn't provide the coverage to sort of have that kind of engagement. So one of the things that I did when I was in Sri Lanka and India is provided workshops to the media groups, to the producers. And after I provided the workshop, uh, this was like a month later, the top national television network called Rupa Vahini in Sri Lanka, they aired my story, Gods and Shackles. So for the Sri Lankan audience, because they do the same thing as we do in India, and I should thank a couple of people that actually did this in Sri Lanka. One of them is Su Sudarshini Fernando, and the other one was Sujiwa Jaisinghe. They too, they, you know, they, they collaborated with me, they took me to the TV station, we provided a workshop, and then we had them buy into the fact that we need to continue to provide this kind of coverage to stop the religious institutions from using elephants, um, you know, uh, under the guise of religion, actually. There's nothing religious about it. So here's what I was going to talk about, the systems thinking, which says everything is connected. System, as uh, D Daniela Meadows, she wrote this book called Systems... Um, systems thinking. And in that book she says, system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. Think about that for a minute. Interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. That, those interconnected, that interconnected set of elements could be the words you choose. What is it achieving? What is your mission? How are you framing? How are you structuring? Is it going to resonate? Is it simple and easy to understand? And the news media should realize that nothing happens in isolation. So your, the way you present your news story should make the news media realize that everything is interconnected. And that was actually by my professor, Dr. Bob Cull, who is a wonderful person. And then George Lakoff, who is a linguistic specialist, he says that humans use narratives to weave together fragmented observations to construct meaning and realities. And so think about what kind of social meaning can you construct through symbols and systems and create a sense of connection, connecting the dots, which is why I think it's important to sit back and reflect on what you're going to submit as your press release before you send it out and ensure that you're connecting all the dots. One suggested technique, as I already mentioned, is framing the scientific information in ways that provide context and resonates with audiences. And scientists can actually help the media by contextualizing distant stories thematically, making it easier for media to cover the story. This is from Bill Hutchison, the, t the nighttime news anchor in, uh, in Toronto. He works for the CTV. He used to work for the CTV. And again, it's, it's about communication strategy that will catapult and empower the mass media to spur public engagement and ultimately have the public take action as well as the, you know, the, the people that are actually involved in creating these legislations and policies. So this is my personal experience. Context, emotions, imagery, icons, narratives, they connect the audience to the bigger picture of wildlife and environmental issues. So if you can think about the context, what emotions you put into it, the imagery that you can use, what kind of icons that you can use that will connect them 
in back home, if there's an icon, for instance, the elephant that passed away here, Paki, that is your cultural icon here in or in, in Portland. How can you connect what happened to him to what is happening globally? How you can connect that episode thematically and bring the global context? And how what is happening in the world is going to impact you locally? So those interconnections should be articulated very clearly. And I tried my best to do that. And I may have succeeded. I, 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 I don't know. I just may have. But <laughs> I had a crazy media coverage in India. Uh, regardless of the fact that the advertisers, mostly elephant owners, brokers, and festival organizers, they have bought out most of the media outlets. This is in southern India. By the way, whatever I have presented so far is applicable to the media across all cultures. It's just a general, uh, general you know, way of looking at what the TV news media generally tends to focus on. So it's not necessarily North Americanized, although I've given a lot of Canadian examples. Uh, but this one is from India. And so what happens is when advertisers and vested interest folks, they are actually selling, giving money to the media outlets, they are going to be extremely careful. And so they were reluctant. But in spite of that, they were massive. I opened up the Pandora's box because I ended up personally contacting a few journalists, talking to them individually, and building relationships, trusting relationships, and you know, in a manner that they would realize that you're not doing this to get publicity. You're doing this for the sake of, for the love of elephants. It's not about me at all. It's not about what is in it for my movement either. It's about how badly the elephants are suffering. And be, be, you know, uh, behind the veil of culture and religion, what are we doing to these same elephants that we call the embodiment of Lord Ganesh? That's what they're called, right? It's so ironic and it's so paradoxical. And so you kind of try to get them to think in that manner, build trusting relationships. And because a lot of times they don't even think in this manner. So this is some of the media coverage that I received that God's in shackle strikes a tender chord. And this is me in that, in that Malayalam language in Kerala. And this is the kind of images that I, I, I pre gave them, but somehow they ended up finding my images somewhere. And they used, because I really did not want my images to be on those at all. I wanted elephants to be there. So then the next step for me is to let you know that because of all the relationships that I've built, Gods and Shackles is being considered to be screened on a major TV station. Uh, on the World Environment Day, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> and, um, I'm in and I mentioned about the Sri Lanka coverage in December 2016. And, you know, I hope to train a few news networks in India when I'm there, when I return, because they play a significant role. And I'm connected closely with many, many media uh, folks and I and and I tell them I, I they they say can you do this can you help me do this like so they ask me for help and I go out of my way to find the information they need and I cover it I give them simple language bullet points and I say these are science science based to make their lives easier tell me if there's anything I can do to help you you know and then I'm in discussions with another TV to produce and co-host a massive series on Asian elephants in Malayalam, which is, going, which is hopefully going to be screened in Kerala's native language also. So it works. When you work the media, <laughs> thank you. When you work the media, they, they, you, know, they, you, can, you, can, you can talk to them. You don't have to manipulate them at all. Just be truthful, honest, genuine, sincere, emotional. When you feel the emotions, don't manipulate the emotions. Just speak like you are, be authentic, because that's what they need. And that's what I would empower you guys to do. So I hope that everything I said may be of some help to you guys. Thank you for this awesome opportunity. Thank you.
Oh, I wanted to mention something. If anybody wants to know how to connect the dots, I've got a DVD. I was lucky enough to be able to produce a one-hour documentary on connecting the dots, which also won a couple of awards. I didn't make a big deal out of it, but I'm selling it for 10 bucks outside. If you want to buy it, it's available, and it's only 10 bucks. And it's called Connecting the Dots, Television, News, Media, and Climate Change, but it's completely applicable to what's going on in our animal world also. So next up.